In this video, we are going to learn how the Indian economy plans to kickstart after this lockdown and what the government has planned out. In India, any strategy, decision or policy regarding the economy is taken by the Ministry of Finance and the Reserve Bank of India. These two are the main bodies. I am going to use different colors so that it's easy to follow up. Ministry of Finance controls the economy by using fiscal policy. Reserve Bank of India controls the economy by using the monetary policy. Under fiscal policy, there are two main tools, that is taxes and spending. The government has the right to collect taxes and any changes in tax policy will have some noticeable changes. Similarly, the money collected through tax is used by the government in supporting various welfare scheme, relief packages, defense, pension, government salaries, food subsidy, interest payments, health and there are many such areas. And by the way, if you want to know what is government's economic or relief package and what's the use of it, I have a separate video on it. Please go and watch that. You will understand the underlying principle behind this kind of measures. Now coming to the monetary policy. The main tools of the monetary policy are CRR, SLR, bank rate, repo rate, reverse repo rate and open market operations, which means buying and selling of government securities. The RBI uses these tools to control the flow of money in the market. This helps the RBI to control the inflation and liquidity in the economy. Let's begin with our analysis by first acknowledging the basic truths. You see, we need a reference point to draw the first conclusion. That's how we will understand the situation step by step and the possible solution. This kind of approach is not only true in economics, but in general life. There has to be a methodology for understanding and making sense of any complex question. For that, the first thing you need to do is to establish the first point of reference. The first thing that we need to do is to acknowledge two basic things, or rather we can say truths. They are, the first point is, due to this lockdown, right now in India, a large population has lost incomes, savings and jobs. And the second point is, the growth and success of the economy totally depends on consumption. Consumption is one of the extremely important concept in economics because it helps determine the growth and success of the economy. Consumption is the beginning of all human economic activities. The reason consumption is important because every time you purchase or buy something, you are adding to consumption. You can also call it consumer spending. Consumer spending eventually drives the demand. So these are the two basic important points that we have to acknowledge right now. One is loss of incomes, savings and jobs and the other one is fall in consumption. Now that we have established these two important points, so this is going to be a point of reference. If you look at these two important points, you will realize both are interdependent on each other. What I mean is consumption is dependent on your income, job and savings. Similarly, if you have a job, then that will bring income. And that is how you will be able to save and consume. That means these two are interdependent on each other. However, the government has to decide which problem needs to be addressed first. I'm not saying that the government will focus on this and not on that. It will focus on everything. I'm only saying on priority basis, the government has to put focus on one problem at a time. Because if you look at these two problems, any steps or policy changes regarding employment, savings, investments will take some time to show any noticeable effect. But then consumption means demand. Somehow if consumer spending increases, that will increase the demand. And the idea is if demand increases, then businesses will kickstart to maintain supply. Ideally that is how the economy will restart. A good analogy would be, we all have faced this. If your bike has less fuel or no fuel, it is recommended that you tilt your bike sideways so that whatever little drop of fuel you have will help your bike to start and somehow you reach the petrol pump and fill up your tank. Similarly, to kickstart an economy, it is recommended that we look at the consumption side. And the government should try everything to give a push or increase the consumption because consumption will lead to an increase in demand and if the demand increases, it will be an incentive that will boost the companies to produce more goods. That means companies will hire more people or at least it will not lay off their workers. Anyhow, I hope you understood that income and consumption is interdependent on each other. But consumption has to be the first priority. 
Now what you need to do is you need to look at the society objectively. What I mean is if you look at the economic division of the society, it is divided into four parts, high income group, middle income group, low income group and economically weaker section. In fact, the government uses this classification for various housing schemes. Always remember this point. Although the government is there for everyone, but when it comes to welfare schemes or any kind of arthik madad, the government's first priority is always the low income group and economically weaker sections. And in the moment of crisis, for example right now during this lockdown, although everything is shut for everyone, the middle income group and the high income group, they are somehow surviving on their savings and partial or full salary. It is the low income group and the economically weaker section who are affected majorly by this lockdown. And by the way, these two groups are the reason behind the informal sector of a country. Nearly 90% of the country's workforce is in the informal sector. This sector is neither taxed nor monitored by any form of government. These include home workers, street vendors, day laborers, etc. When I say informal sector, please don't misjudge my tone. I respect their hard work and I personally believe in supporting local businesses. In fact, the word informal has a negative connotation. So please don't judge my tone. Even the farmers fall under the category of low income group or economically weaker section. And agriculture as a whole is part of the informal sector. It is not part of the formal sector. Except the part where the government purchases commodities at minimum support price directly from the farmer. Only that part can be called as a formal transaction. Otherwise, largely agricultural goods are part of the informal sector. And the income from it is not taxable. So if it is not taxable, then it is part of informal sector. From past one month, you must have seen it in the news that many migrant workers are walking back to their hometown. These workers belong to Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Jharkhand, Odisha, Madhya Pradesh and West Bengal. So they all fall under this low income group or economically weaker section. In other words, they are part of the informal sector. Anyhow, my point is, it is the low income group and economically weaker section who are affected majorly by this lockdown. Although everyone is facing difficulty in their own ways, however, people who are in lower end of the social strata are suffering more. Now let's go to the business side and look at some elements of that. In the formal sector, the government of India categorizes companies in micro enterprise, small enterprise, then medium enterprise. Together they are known as MSME sector. And then there are large businesses like Reliance, Tata, Mahindra etc. There is another industry which is called the cottage industry. It is a business or manufacturing activity carried on in people's homes. Cottage industries are both part of the formal as well as informal sector. There are small home businesses which do pay taxes to the government and then there are who do not pay at all. Finally, there is the informal sector about which I just spoke about. They almost comprise of 90% of the Indian economy. The only problem with informal sector is that the government has no control over it and the activities of the informal economy are not included in a country's GDP or GNP. The low income group and economically weaker section are mostly part of the informal sector. I am not saying 100% but mostly. Similarly, the high income group and the middle income group are part of the formal sector. Even here I am not saying 100%. Because there are many people in high income group and middle income group whose income is not monitored by the government. A good example is income from property. Although it is a taxable income, but many people don't show it. Many Indians don't see any clear link between paying taxes and provision of government services. That is why only tiny percentage of people in India actually pay income tax. Anyways, I'm constantly diverting by giving away tiny bits of information, please don't mind. Anyhow, so the low income group and economically weaker sections are mostly part of the informal sector. Some part of the low income group people are also employed by the MSME sector as low wage workers. Similarly, middle income group and high income group are mostly part of the formal sector. Even in this category, there are many whose source of income are not monitored by the government. But largely, I hope you are able to follow up with me. Actually, I forgot about the banks. Although I have mentioned RBI, under RBI, we have the banks. RBI is the regulator of the banking sector and it includes all the banks, both private as well as public. Even the non-banking financial companies like Muthut Finance, Bajaj Finance, Chola Mandalam, Mahindra Finance, Tata Capital, etc. also comes under the RBI. 
Basically, they provide bank-like services like loans, advances, but they are not a bank. A bank lends money and it also accepts deposits. But on the other hand, a non-banking financial company only lends money. It cannot accept deposits from public. I hope you understood the difference. So under RBI, we have the private banks, the public sector banks and non-banking financial companies. Alright then, I guess I have covered everyone who plays an important role in the economy. Now this is the basic bird view angle of the Indian economy. Now we need to look at the guidelines and policy changes that the government has made in order to kickstart the Indian economy when the lockdown ends. Imagine this as a game of chess and all of these different pieces are Shatranj ke mohare. Now whatever the policy changes and guidelines of the government that you read, simply apply to this game of chess and you will be able to predict and see what the outcome is going to be. You see economy is a lot like the game of chess. You move different pieces to reach your objective. The only difference is, in the real game of chess, you play to checkmate the king. But in the economy, you don't have to checkmate anything. You only have to move the pieces so that everything works smoothly. The objective is to stabilize the economy. Or maybe sometimes you do need to checkmate when foreign policy is involved. Because you don't want to get dominated by opposite country. This is especially true with the United States. They often use the bullying approach as part of their foreign policy. In other words, they always try to checkmate. Now let's look at the highlights of the government's Atma Nirbhar Bharat Abhiyan package. Before we start, I want to point out something. On May 13th, when Prime Minister Modi announced the 20 lakh crore economic package, I want you to pay attention to the words economic package. It is not a relief package, it is an economic package. The meaning of relief package is giving some sort of direct financial or practical assistance to the people by giving real money. For example, direct cash transfer is a form of a relief package. Here the government is giving direct money into the accounts of the beneficiary. But on the other hand, an economic package is a bit more vast and complicated. The government is not putting its own money. By own money, I mean the tax money. Instead, the government is changing some policies and systems that would encourage the financial system to come back on track. If I have to explain this in a simple way, let's say you have a business and currently your turnover is 1 crore rupees. Now if the government makes few changes and tells you that you can go and avail loan which previously was a little bit difficult because there were many restrictions, now you can avail the loan without keeping any collateral. And let's say you take the loan due to which your turnover increases from 1 crore to 5 crores. If you notice, the government did not put any real money. The government simply changed the policy so that you can avail the loan easily. In other words, government has become a guarantor to the bank and the other financial institutions. That means the burden comes on banks. Now if you calculate the risk and cost behind this kind of policy changes, this is what is the meaning of an economic package. And if you notice, an economic package is for the businesses and institutions. It is not for the people directly. Of course, if the businesses benefit, that will ultimately benefit the people. However, economic packages is not directly for the people. But the cost behind the package has to be distributed among the public. In economics, there is a term called flypaper theory. What it means is, no matter what you do or whatever changes that you make, someone at the end has to bear the cost. It is going to be the general public. That means this 20 lakh crore is not government's own tax collected money. It is basically putting people's own money in fixing the economy and encouraging the financial system to give out more loans. Anyways, let's look at the highlights of the Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan package. The entire package has been divided into 5 tranches. In this video, I will cover the first tranche which has the maximum allocation and it is directed towards the MSME sectors, then the non-banking financial companies and the power sector. So the first one is the biggest announcement made was that the finance minister announced collateral free loans worth Rs 3 lakh crore for MSMEs. It is said that this move is likely to benefit 45 lakh units so they can resume their businesses. So this is what I meant by an economic package. Here the 3 lakh crore money is not the government's own money. This is the bank's money. In other words, the depositors money. Depositors are people like you and me. The central government is acting like a guarantor and telling the banks to provide loans without any collateral. 
In case if something goes wrong, let's say the companies failed to pay back the loan, the government is going to take the guarantee of these loans. When government takes guarantee, always remember the losses will be socialized or distributed among the general public. So this amount is going to be provided by the banks as well as the non-banking financial companies to the MSME sector. Let's say you have a business. When you take loan, you take loan to increase the production. That also means you're going to hire more people. That will create jobs. So everything looks good, right? These are collateral free loan, meaning you don't have to offer any asset to the bank. As long as your company is doing good, there is no problem. But let's say your company goes into loss, then you will not be able to pay the loan. And that becomes a non-performing asset for the banks. So if this situation comes, the government is going to distribute the losses among the public. But let's say your company is doing good with the help of this loan. Always remember the loan has to be paid back with certain interest. That means the cost of the product produced by your company will have to be more. Otherwise, how are you going to make profit? Pay back the loan with interest? Then you also have to pay tax to the government because keep in mind, right now the government is running out of money and you also have to pay salaries to your employees. Your company has to be super efficient in saving money and also make profit. In any recession, job loss is a common scenario. If not job loss, at least the salary offered will be low. So I hope you are able to understand how this packages is going to benefit the businesses and also the government. On the other hand, the prices of commodity will go up and the income of the people will go down. Let's go to the second point. The government has reduced statutory provident fund contribution of private sector employers and employees from the current mandated 12% to 10% for next three months. What it means is if you're working in a private sector, the PF amount, the provident fund amount is cut from your salary every month. Previously, it was at 12% of your basic salary plus DNS allowance. For example, let's say your salary is 1000. So 12% 12 means 120 rupees. Rupees 120 will be cut by your company from your salary every month towards your provident fund. And then the company will pay the same amount equal to your contribution. In other words, 120 plus 120, that is 240, will be your total PF money every month. Now what the government has done is, it has reduced this 12% to 10%. Again, it is important to understand that the government is not spending a single rupee from its own pocket. So previously, if it was 12%, 12% was deducted from your basic salary and dearness allowance. But now if it is 10%, that means less money will be deducted. A cut in provident fund contribution will increase your monthly take home pay for the next three months. Now that your monthly take home pay will be a little more, if at all you come under the tax bracket, then your income tax payable amount will also go up. That means if you notice carefully, previously with 12%, whatever interest you would have earned on your PF money will be cancelled out now when your monthly take home pay will increase. Because you will have to pay income tax on this extra income. Again, the government is not putting a single rupee from its own pocket. It is making small policy changes for adding more liquidity. The idea behind this is that when people have more money in their hands, they will spend more. But the government is smart in taking out the money from you by this way or that way. However, now for the next three months, the companies have to pay a little less on your PF. So again, even this move helps the business directly. The third point is, the government has announced Rs 90,000 crore liquidity for power distribution companies. See, one thing you need to understand is that during this lockdown, the electricity consumption throughout the country has gone down. Since there was no business activity going on, commercial and industrial power demand has taken a hit after many factories have shut down. If you notice, it is the power distribution companies that have gone in loss because they have to pay a lot of money to the power generating companies. Since all the industrial and commercial operations are shut, the demand for electricity in commercial sector has gone down. However, the demand for electricity at home is high because everyone is at home. And I think you are aware that the domestic use of electricity is cheaper compared to commercial use. On one hand, you cannot shut the power plant completely. And on the other hand, you are not able to supply electricity for businesses which earns more profit. Please don't think that the electricity is being stored in a battery somewhere like a commodity. It does not work that way. Electricity is generated continuously and supplied in real time. As a result, 
the power distribution companies are going in huge losses along with past dues. Now the Power Finance Corporation PFC and Rural Electrification Corporation Limited, these are public infrastructure finance company and they are also non-banking financial companies. They will give this 90,000 crore to the power distribution companies as loan. Again, I want to point out that central government is not putting any of its own money into this. It is simply telling the power finance company to lend this money to the power distribution companies so that they can pay what they owe to power generating companies. The loans will have to be guaranteed by the respective state governments. That means the cost will be covered by increasing the electricity prices once the economy restarts. Any increase in the cost of electricity both domestically and commercially will fall directly on the consumer. And the fourth point is, the government also announced rupees 30,000 crore liquidity push for non-banking financial companies, housing finance companies and microfinance institutions. If you look at the words liquidity push, it again means the same thing. The government is not putting its own money. Liquidity refers to the availability of cash. So if the government is not putting its own money, then the next question would be, how will the non-banking financial companies get the cash? The banks will have to invest through primary and secondary market transactions. In primary market transaction, the banks are the investor, so they will buy the shares of the company. In secondary market transactions, the bank who is an investor can sell the shares to other investors through stock exchange. Now this kind of rotation of the money is expected to generate some cash for the non-banking financial companies, housing finance companies and the microfinance institutions. Because it is a known fact that the NBFCs have been a significant credit provider to the MSME sector. And MSME sector play an important role in the overall growth of the Indian economy. They create more jobs in the formal sector. Banks have always been reluctant in giving loans to the MSME sector. But now the banks will sanction loans to MSME and NBFCs because the government is willing to give the guarantee. Anyhow, this kind of liquidity push will make the NBFCs finance more. However, you should be aware of the fact that the loans that are given by the NBFCs have a very high rate of interest. It is much higher than the banks. So if you have a business and you take a loan from any NBFC, you will have to pay a higher rate of interest. That means this cost will be included in the production cost. That will certainly increase the price of the commodity. Always remember, the simple formula for any private company to function efficiently is to have cheap labor and high value product. So that the company can pay all the expenses, including the tax to the government. I would like to reiterate the fact that the government has not put any of its own money. It is simply encouraging the banks to give out more loans. In other words, banks use your money to make money. Anyhow, these were the key announcements about the government's Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan package. And I also hope that you have understood the difference between a relief package and an economic package.